please. Um, as I get my screen set up, I, I'd like to reiterate leave this call um, for everyone to drop their names, location, pronouns in the chat so we can all say hey to each other. And at any time, if you think of anything, if you have a point that you'd like raise, um, it would be great to put them on the chat or put this star sign um, so that we can, um, you know, hear what you have to say about the things that we're going to discuss today. Um, let me just share my screen. All right. So um, before I officially begin, I'd like to apologize in advance because um, I have someone coming and for sure my dog is going to make a lot of noise. But let's just think of that as him saying in dog speak climate justice now. So <laughs> um, good afternoon um, from the Philippines. Magandang hapon. Or good morning, magandang umaga, good evening, magandang gabi, wherever in the world you may be. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, for the organizing session under the Global Trainings Week hosted by 350. My name, as you know, is Beatrice Talaga. You can call me Bea, you can call me Beatrice. I'm Senior Regional Organizer for 350.org in Asia. And today, instead of, you know, a more technical, or I don't know how, how we can call that technical, but technical lecture on organizing and campaigning and all of that. This will be more of a reflection, a collective reflection on our organizing as a practice, um, as a site of continuous learning and experimentation and collective liberation. So um, this is called Our Future is Non-Negotiable, Building Solidarity Across Borders Towards Climate Justice. But before um, we get into it, I'd like to honor all the organizers who led us to each other today in this Zoom room in a sea of thousands and thousands of Zoom rooms floating all over the web. Um, I'm going to be really vulnerable here by saying that for the longest time, I haven't felt comfortable calling myself an activist. I'm more comfortable calling myself an organizer because I think it has, it has the beautiful um, task of bringing leading people to each other. So I always begin my speaking engagements like this. I So for now, I'd like to um, invite you all to drop um, the name or, I don't know, any um, definition of the first time you were engaged in any climate justice or any social movement. If you can drop the name of the person who introduced you to activism or movement work or organizing, um, we'd like to honor them for a few seconds. Um, it can be your mom, it can be your best friend, it can be your colleague, it can be a random person who handed you a flyer in the mall. Anyone really. I'd like us to all collectively think back to that one person or one organization even who led you to the work that you're doing today. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself right now. Okay, I'm seeing some notes on the chat already. Um, Monica's dad, um, parents who took Ka to the first protests and social media who introduced um, Will and Hermione to um, protests in general. Okay, so keep just keep them coming. And I'd really like us to, you know, honor the fact that we didn't go to this space, to this activism world, to this movement work through only our own doing, right? Um, it can be always traced back to some group of friends or some person who really um, made the effort to include us, to make it a community towards organizing for not just climate justice, but social justice in general. So Thank you for indulging me in that. And I'd always like us to think back to them whenever things get hard. So yeah, I'd like to honor that. Um, today's session will be, um, as mentioned, it will be centering on two specific questions, um, seeking to understand our personal organizing practice as opposed to a more technical lecture where I talk about, you know, 
a case study or a specific um organizing technique that really helped me although of course there will be that will be interspersed in this talk um it's more really it's really the beauty of this session will really be towards the end where we all collectively reflect on two specific questions and we'll be able to hear from each other because i'm of the opinion that you know um the beauty of organizing is that there are infinite ways to do it right um according to your cultural upbringing your social political situation um there are multiple sites of resistance and um the beauty of this work is that it's never finished it's it's an continuous process of learning and unlearning and yeah with that i'd like to finally officially begin by saying that conferences alone won't save our world and instead people power will win us our future and this is i say this with some as someone who has utmost respect to all the technical policy analysts the scientists the negotiators the policy makers who do the behind the work scenes in negotiating international climate agreements but i also say this as someone whose beginnings in the climate movement can really be traced back to being part of conferences, of being part actually of the Philippine delegation to the UN um, since Lima. And um, honoring my past, I really found my footing in climate policy research, but I still am of the opinion that the most powerful work I've ever done is organizing alongside local and international climate groups, learning as much as I could alongside youth activists, alongside community activists, alongside frontliners. So, um but i i think that work really means that we are building solidarity outside these halls of supposed power um but that alone requires inquiry right like what do we really mean when we say we're standing in solidarity we're building so in solidarity outside of these formal spaces right so that's one of the questions that we're going to be doubling down on later today um and it's what do we really mean when we say we're standing in solidarity and it can look super different in my part of the world in in my the people i organize with as opposed to the people you organize with and how you show up in solidarity in your part of the world. And again, that's the beauty of organizing. So um, in inquiring about solidarity, this is something that I've been thinking about recently also in like, in like um, evaluating if what I'm really doing is still effective by, um, by any means. And I realized that my beginnings in organizing can really be traced to two climate stories. And the first one is during um, a visit to this place in Tacloban in the Philippines. Tacloban is called the ground zero of Typhoon Haiyan. And um, on a rainy January morning in 2016, this man, a city official, led me to this field of white crosses. And um, all 2,917 of them had scribblings um, because they turned out to be names of the dead and the family members just chose which mound, which cross they will grieve and just literally hand, um, hand write, handwritten their, um, the names of their family members who they lost. And that really made me realize then I was a policy researcher that um, you know what I'm doing does not necessarily automatically translate to um, support on the ground. And that's really what led me to organizing. But even more so, um, the um, what cemented my decision to stay in the space is realizing the reality for many environmental activists. Um, and there was this one community who we organized with until now. Um, they lost one one community member because she was um shot dead by still unidentified men um she was called the first extrajudicial killing under president rodrigo then president rodrigo duterte and she was a climate activist she was protecting um their village against a coal stockpile um and she had no other political activities other than this campaign under than you know safeguarding her neighborhood um for her grandchildren for her 18 grandchildren and what these stories really um make apparent is that organizing in the philippines a site of both struggle across um climate impacts and the root causes of climate change um it's really different in the sense that um climate change to us is not really something for the 
for the future. It's not a problem for the future, but rather we're facing it in a myriad of different ways, like for example, climate impacts and also um, fossil fuel com uh, affected communities facing health issues, human rights violations, and even violent threats and um, killings. Um, and that is, we expect that to even be more intensified um, in the next six years under our new president. And this is so heartbreaking, but um, right, that leads back to the question, right? Like, what do we do to stand in solidarity? How do we organize our communities in such a way that there is active, continued, persistent resistance against this? And we draw our strength from these stories on the ground and we really try to um, uplift the stories of um, the frontline communities facing both impacts and fossil fuel abuses in this country. Um, so basically that leads to my first point about how the needs of communities in general will not be all addressed in conferences alone. And they serve to rubber stamp the work that's being carried out by grassroots movements all over the world sending policy signals and what should be done. And this serve as our pressure points, our movement's pressure points for even more ambition. But as we all know, we wouldn't be here today if we think conferences are, you know, are going to magically solve all our issues. How do we then mobilize and organize beyond conferences, beyond high-level spaces? Um, What's beautiful about the climate strikes is that it brought um, both the use of Bataan and Tacloban, the two story, the sites of the stories that I shared earlier. Um, they brought those young people out in the streets. They joined the global climate strike. And this pushed media and even politicians in the Philippines to talk about climate justice. So it's not anymore a situation or a story about mitigation, adaptation targets, but also justice for the communities affected. And there was this one um, lawmaker who introduced this resolution seek signifying the support of the House of the Philippine Representatives for the climate strikes. And again, that just seeks to, you know, solidify that's the work that's being done on the ground. And um, this is also replicated in the um in the um regional organizing efforts of young people, climate strikers um who formed the Asia Climate Rally. So the Asia Climate Rally was organized both online and offline during COVID-19. So what happened was climate strikers from various countries organized together um first like very much online like a four hour live stream a social media store twitter spaces all of that but even beyond that um they hope to identify common asian targets um right now that that takes the form of um development banks and private banking institutions who continue to fund fossil fuel projects but they're also targeting other regional bodies in asia so um, what that seeks to uplift is that from these stories on the ground, climate strikers really mainstream um, climate as a justice issue that's be, that affects everyone. And organizing the Asia Climate Rally to become this, this group of friends that um pretty similar to what everyone shared on the chat earlier, to be this group of friends who sought to involve more people into organizing towards climate justice. Um, has now been like turned into actual human to human friendships. Like this is not um this is not just um a way for these youth to you know um get support for their climate strike but or other political work, but they have started to form human to human relationships, and that's why I think it's super important to have this perspective: the shifting from mile wide, inch deep movements to inch wide, mile deep relationship building that sustains movements. And I guess if you're taking away one thing from the space today, it's really, you know, the question of how do we make sure that when we say that we're organizing ordinary people towards climate justice, more and more people to join the climate movement, how do we also ensure that the that this participation in this movement work will be sustainable um, through relationship building? How do we protect and and honor and really do the painstaking work of maintaining these relationships, even outside formal activism spaces, right? Like, how do we make sure that 
relationship building and relationship deepening really take center stage in this organizing work. Because I think organizing is really about, at the end of the day, it's about building relationships, leading people into each other, yes, but also making sure that these connections are sustained enough that they overthrow not just literal governments in the case of the Philippines, but also you know, um, seek to undo the damages of multiple sites of oppression. So um, I really like this quote that I encountered when I was studying a couple, a short course a couple of months ago um, about how hope is defined, right? Like hope, they um, according to um, the, this Jewish scholar, Moses Maimonides of the 12th century, hope is the belief of the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. And I think that's really what organizing is about, isn't it? Right, like believing that a better world is actually possible as opposed to the doom and gloom of the probable. And I think it's always a question of hope, right? Like how do we intentionally infuse our organizing with this power of hope and love um, amidst a persistently warming world against a background of disinformation, killings, threats, extreme poverty amidst a pandemic. How do we actually continue to organize that centers hope, that brings toward um, hope and love to the surface amidst every difficult thing that we as human beings are facing right now? Um, that was very short, but I really hope that we can focus on the sharings and then we'll come back in plenary after. So today, we're going to be grouped first into two groups. Um, the first group will answer the question, what do we really mean when we say we're standing in solidarity? And I, I should correct myself. I don't really mean that we should answer this question um, with finality today. It's more like reflecting on this question, on what do we really mean when we say we're standing in solidarity with each other's fights? And the second group will reflect on the question, how do we intentionally infuse our organizing with hope and love, no matter what your source of hope and love is and however you define solidarity for the first group. So, okay, I think Monica will be taking us into the two groups and um, just uh, just decide on the first group will do the solidarity question, the second group will do the organizing with hope question. Okay, take us away, Monica. Okay, so room one, um, we'll be answering sorry directly question. Um, you can see it in the more tab. You can just join the breakout group, and then room two will answer the hope and love organizing question. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Do you want to join a breakout group? Um, Enviro Arg. <laughs> oh, okay.
Hey, en, en, is it en Vero? Um, I've just seen your message. That's really great. Um, maybe your group can take one of the questions and discuss it uh, together. And when if if we do feedback, maybe we can hear from from your group as well. But feel free to to pick one of the two questions, whichever one uh, works best for you, maybe.
Okay, I see some people are coming back. Welcome back to the main room. How was that? <laughs> okay, let's just wait for the rest, maybe a couple more seconds. Hi everyone, welcome back. Right? All right, so how was that? Um, I was really intending to make this session, um, the sharing part, a little bit longer, but considering that we are a relatively smaller group, I was hoping to reserve some time for like collectively reflecting on the questions, like reporting back from the groups on what you spoke about. Um, and it's really with the intention of, you know, taking a minute, taking a breather from usual day-to-day -day organizing and campaigning programmatic work because I realized that you know, um, the whys of why we do this can sometimes get lost in the mix over the years. Like, um, like you know, um, whenever I do organizing regionally, like even with training events or like with recruitment for um, in, in alongside our partners, we really do drop these terms a lot, right? Like we say that we stand in solidarity with this event, with this organization, with this movement, with this cause. And we really say that, you know, we're organizing so that we'll have hope amidst the climate crisis and all the intersecting crises. But it's really helpful, at least for me personally, to really take the time to reflect on these questions alongside fellow organizers. So I hope the space, however short that was, was equally useful for you all. Okay, so one of the things that I heard um, from when I was hopping around the rooms is that um, the importance of solidarity is really recognizing the need for it. Um, and there's an impact in people not actually standing in solidarity. And from the other group, um, when I was there, someone was talking about how, you know, organizing, um, how, how being anchored on hope and love really traces back its roots to having a common vision and shared values, like common goals that we can work towards so that we can experience success together as a collective. But I'm wondering, of course, um, I'm I'm really acknowledging my blind spots here, not just in this space, but also as an organizer um, whose organizing is also very limited by where I am um, and the people I organize with. Um, but what else came up from... Um, your conversations. Maybe we can have someone um, share about what they talked about. Like anyone can just put the star sign on the chat or you can raise your hand then you can share about either of these two questions or even both if you want to. I was hearing like a lot of like spirited discussion in both groups. So I was hoping you can share it back to the other people from the other group. Does anyone want to share? Mm -hmm. Yeah, after Monica, you can also put notes in this chat if you'd like. If, you'd, if you're in a spot where you can't unmute, you can also put your reflections on the chat.
Okay, I'm just gonna acknowledge the fact that um one of our participants today is actually a group of like 20 people. Hello to EnviroVito.org. Thank you for joining us today, all of you. Um, and also, I appreciate everyone for taking the time to go to this session today. Um, but I'd like to hear from of, from you, um, like what you thought about, like, you know, because I'm very much limited by where I am in the world, the people that I organize with, my personal circumstances. My view of the world is very limited as an organizer and as a human being. So I would like to really inquire on what your views are on what does it mean for you to stand in solidarity with each other's fights, with other climate-affected communities, with other movements? How do we operationalize that? Oh, go ahead, Hermione. Sorry, I hope that I'm saying that right. Almost, but it's okay. <laughs> um, we were talking about like the idea of a global solidarity and how. So I was saying I'm based in the UK. So like, how can I target institutions or corporations or anything that are causing harm in other countries, but working together with those movements um, as well, and other countries yeah just other countries working together um to help combat like the more global fight thank you for sharing that um does anyone want to respond to that Um, I'm just gonna call on <laughs> there were these um there was this group who talked about how organizing should be anchored on shared values and shared vision. Maybe from someone from the second group can share more about that. Because I think it all links together, right? Like, you know, we can't organize without a shared vision, collective solidarity, and all of that. Like, how does that play into our work? Uh, maybe someone from the second group can share the organizing with the hope group um sagar are you able to share about your point or both well okay uh thank you very much for the opportunity uh yes from our group we we discussed that there should be a sense of uh collectivism in in the movement uh where we are saying that uh they should be a unity of purpose having the same uh, ideology towards achieving the goal that you intend to achieve as a group so uh we are having a situation whereby each and every member of the movement have to have that uh ability to know what is expected of them in order for us to achieve the common, the ultimate common purpose of the entire movement, of the entire group, of the entire uh, 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 circle that we are, we, we, we are having. So that was uh, another part uh, of, 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 our, um, of, of our discussion. And also, it's also it is also important to infuse uh, that, that welcoming spirit in that movement that each each and everyone who wants to be part of that uh, movement who actually feel that they are welcome uh in that movement not to to to, to discriminate uh certain people uh based on race based on uh, color skin color or whatever but you should be welcoming so that our organizing can accommodate each and every a uh, uh, person who feels that they are part and parcel of the vision that we have. Thank you so much, Bothwell, um, for that perspective and that reflection. Um, with that, I would like to plug our um, um our next sessions. Um, since we're talking about like identifying common goals, right, and uniting behind common goals, common targets, there's actually two campaigning sessions upcoming and also if it hasn't happened already um there's also a 
uh, session on like how do we sustain our movements because this work of course is admittedly very hard can sometimes be very draining can sometimes lead you to burnout like how do we sustain our movements and each other so there's also those sessions under the global training so you can I would just like to plug that but I also like to uplift the ones on the chat the importance of collaboration fighting towards um, standing in solidarity across aligned groups um, yeah so does anyone else have any reflections on um before we go into the final um reflections from my end sagar yeah, so, you're unmuted? okay yes yeah, so uh, a few months ago i actually uh, been researching about the world called uh, sustainability what exactly sustainability is in uh, from an indian culture or an indian perspective it has a different meaning from western it is different but uh, when i was uh, looking at sustainability uh, from the global perspective i found that there are three uh, main uh, three main things which are actually uh, composed of sustainability the one is ecology the second is economy and the third is equity so any action if it's supporting uh, these uh, three parameters equally uh, or, or um, then that goal can be a sustainable and i know uh, united nations or uh, this global organization are promoting global goals and sustainable goals and every business is actually promoting about the sustainability so uh, i'm i'm okay with it but uh, for example, the equity part from the sustainability, if there are a limited number of people who are actually uh, who are actually managing the industries, managing the natural resources, then that company or that industry can't be a sustainable. So uh, as, as both will actually said that there should be a solidarity there should be equality there should be a certain level of redistribution of power redistribution of resources in that way any business any movement or any initiative can be a sustainable and that is more uh, productive i guess thank you thank you so much sagar all right so um I think one of the things that I learned the hard way is that um, there are no finished conversations and that we have to accept that reflections on organizing is really an ongoing process. And I really hope that we can keep connected. Um, I'm going to be mentioning some opportunities to get connected in, in a few, but um, I hope that today we were able to like you know, um, reflect again together and inspire this culture of reflection on, um, because we throw these words around like in our communications, in our campaign materials, and all of that. Um, but how do we how do we actually make sure that we constantly learn and unlearn previous preconceptions about solidarity, organizing, hope, love, collective care, as we go further and further further in building a better world. So, um. Yeah, basically, I heard also from the groups that there must be, um, you know, a working towards across movements. Um, we have to continue to organize and build intersectional people power and solidarity from the ground up, taking leadership from communities, from the most affected people and areas, listening to each other and centering collective care so that we can um, anchor our work on common values. Um from my end in the Philippines, um, I think we should also work towards pressuring our leaders for policies that don't just aim at resilience or adaptation. Um, and we also demand justice, um, support for just transition and reparations. And um, a lot, I think there are sessions, not just in 350, but in the 350 trainings website that talk about using storytelling in our organizing um, and how to work with allies so that we can uplift climate change. It's not just a technical greenhouse gas emissions issue, but also a story of resistance against multiple sites of oppression. 
And for those based in Asia, or if you're interested, um, you're not based in Asia, but you're interested in working, standing in solidarity with the Asia Climate Movement, um, there's gonna be the Asia Solidarity Lab on September 24 and 25. That's, I think, the last weekend, if not the third weekend of September. And we will be launching the registration to be um, this week. But you can keep um, tabs on that by following us on Twitter or other social media. So the ASL 2022 is a gathering supposedly Um, we're targeting youth organizers, but we're also open to everyone who's just getting into the climate work, uh, the climate movement, um, to uplift emerging campaigns, storytelling, and transformative organizing towards climate justice. We'll also be having cultural performances, open spaces to discuss, gather, reflect together, start such as this one, about co-creating our future, and we'll be Focusing on four key themes. The first one is how do we, you know, center community care and activism. Um, there's this talk of a lot of youth organizers burning out, feeling like the work is too much, being super pressured. Um, but how do we make sure that our activism itself is sustainable as we fight for a more sustainable planet? Um, we're also going to be talking about intersectional climate organizing. We're going to be talking about fossil fuel finance campaigning or campaigns, actual real on-ground campaigns on how people are, are targeting financial institutions in shifting their financing away from fossil fuels and towards solutions. And with that, we're also going to be talking about how do we reimagine a better world, right? How What are existing solutions on the ground towards climate and social justice that we can take inspiration for from and with that i think we're um if you have other concerns if you want to join um if you have a local group or if you're interested in organizing in asia or even anywhere in the world really i can connect you to my colleagues outside of the asia regional team um you can connect with me via these emails and on twitter Um, I'd like to thank everyone for taking care, um, I, for taking the time to join this session today. Um, it's really, really means a lot to me to be able to reflect on these questions together, to continue to learn and unlearn so much about organizing as a practice um, in this work towards building a better world that works for people and planet. Thank you, everyone.